Are we similar size? We're fine. Oh, good morning. Constance Walter here with the Sanford Underground Research Facility. Sorry, I was hearing this odd sound and was trying to figure out where it came from. Um, well, welcome back to uh, Neutrino Day, a matter mystery. This morning, we are going to be discussing a matter mystery, the end of the universe. You know, we've talked about the beginning of the universe and some of the different particles that make up the universe throughout the week. Today, we are going to be joined by uh, astrophysicist Dr. Katie Mack, who will be talking with Brian about how the universe may end. Now, throughout the talk, you may submit your questions by commenting wherever you are watching, whether it's on Vimeo, YouTube, Facebook, and um, just let us know what you want to know about how the universe might end. I want to say uh, welcome back to Brian. Thank you so much for everything you've done this week. And uh, welcome, uh, Katie. It's so great to finally meet you and to have you on the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yes. In person, finally meeting. In person, yes. <laughs> And Katie, of course, thank you, Constance. Um, it's been really fun. And today is, for me, uh, my fourth day of Neutrino Day <laughs> um, and my fourth interview. So we started on Tuesday with uh, Mark Hanhart talking about the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang. And then we met Ryan Patterson and talked about neutrinos. Yesterday, Simon Ferrucci um, and I discussed dark matter which actually is an area of specialty uh, for our guests today. So today, sort of bookending it from the Big Bang, today the real topic is the end of the universe. And my guest is an assistant professor of physics at North Carolina State University, and she is an astrophysicist, specifically a cosmologist. Dr. Katie Mack, Katie, it's so good to see you. <laughs> really good to see you too. Um, and although you work here in Raleigh where I am, and where we get to have occasional brunches usually, you've been spending the, this whole semester in Waterloo, uh, Ontario, Canada at the yeah. Perimeter Institute of Theoretical Physics, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm here on a fellowship called the, Emmy Nother, the Simons Emmy Nother Fellowship. And it's a fellowship to bring uh, researchers from around the world to Perimeter Institute to work with people at the Institute, to take advantage of the amazing facilities there. Um, so I arrived in January and um, from mid-March, I've been in an apartment uh, down the street from the, uh, the Institute, but it's been great. I've been participating in uh, events online and going to all the Zoom group meetings and uh, collaborating with people. So um, it's been great to be here and uh, I'm only in Canada for a few more weeks, but uh, it's been very nice. Yeah, that's so cool. And, you know, interestingly, so far, all the physicists that I've interviewed are um, experimentalists. They're mm. all involved with experiments going on at the Sanford uh, Underground Research Facility. Um, and some of them are neutrino related and some of them are dark matter related. Um, yesterday, we were talking about the Lux experiment and the upcoming Lux um, Zeppelin experiment uh, that's an enhancement of that. But you, so you're a theoretical physicist. So can you just tell me, I think that's, that's so fascinating. Can you tell me something about the difference uh, between a, a theoretical physicist and these experimentalists? Yeah, so I actually I actually started as an experimental particle physicist. I started doing neutrino research. Uh, so when I was when I was younger, I worked uh, at the Super Kamiokande um, neutrino detector in Japan uh, for a short while, and then and then also the long baseline experiment K two K, where I was at an accelerator where we were shooting neutrinos at the detector through the Earth, uh, which was a lot of fun. But um, since then, I've been more involved in theory work, and the way that the way that it works is. That uh, I don't I don't do the experiments, but I um, I do a lot of thinking about what future experiments or observations might see. So I actually sit kind of somewhere in the middle between pure theory and and experiments and observations. So 
I uh, talk to theoretical physicists and find out what kinds of cool new uh, theories are out there, what kind of models for things like dark matter and other particle physics things uh, are happening. And then I talk to people who do experiments and use telescopes. And I find out what kinds of experiments can be done, what's the data that they're gonna get from that, what kinds of uh, observations are coming up, what are the telescopes uh, being built right now, what are they gonna see? And my job is to try to figure out how to connect those two things. So I don't come up with new theories, um, but I don't ever touch data. So I'm, I'm a theorist from the perspective of not working with data and not working with experiments or observatories. Um, but I'm, I'm in an area you might call phenomenology. And, and it's, it's fun because it's a creative space. So I get to find out what the cool new things are on either side of this, um, of, of this sort of range and then find, try to come up with creative new ways to figure out uh, from the data we're going to get what, which uh, theories are, are, are going to be testable. So I have, to, I have to be able to understand what the theories predict and how that relates to how things work out, in their, out there in the cosmos, how things will happen inside experiments, and, uh, and then say, okay, if we do this experiment or if we do this observation, here's what we can test, here's what we can see, um, this is the interesting thing to look for, and this is why we should make sure that we're collecting this kind of data. That's really cool. Then do you eagerly look forward to the results of all these big experiments because of, of yeah. how they'll interact with your theory? Work? Yeah, of course. I mean, yeah, like I've, I've been very much looking forward to some of the big telescopes being put together soon, like the square kilometer array, which is a radio uh, telescope array. And it's, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be in um, Australia and Southern Africa. Uh, it's a huge array, lots of... Um, lots of different instruments as part of that. And they're gonna be able to observe a whole lot of different things. But one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is they're gonna be able to observe some of the earliest galaxies in the universe and how, how those came together. And, and that relates a little bit to some of the work that I do relating to dark matter and how that affects early galaxies. Um, but I'm also interested in the results of new experiments like new uh, collider experiments, new neutrino experiments, um, which might, you know, answer some of these big questions about particle physics and about things like dark matter. And you're a cosmologist. So could you just give us a, a definition of cosmology? What's the range of cosmology within astrophysics? Uh, so cosmology is, I, I often say it's, it's the study of the entire universe from beginning to end, um, the evolution of the universe, the contents of the universe, the fundamental laws of, of, the you know working physics in the universe uh so it it it's really the big questions and the kind of uh i don't know the things that relate to the bigger picture so in in physics uh if you're in a physics department and you're talking to someone and they say they're a cosmologist oftentimes that means that there will be somebody who studies the very early universe so the you know the big bang and the the very first few moments of the cosmos they might also be studying things like uh, general relativity, this, the theory of gravity, or how um, how the the fundamental workings of the cosmos all fit together. You know, uh, theories of of um, the expansion of the universe, the how how uh, structure forms in the cosmos. If you go to an astronomy department and someone says they're a cosmologist, oftentimes that means that they'll look at really distant galaxies because as we look farther into the cosmos, we're looking deeper into time. So we're looking at uh, the past, which means that we're looking at, you know, learning about the evolution of the cosmos. And we're also looking at a really large amount of the cosmos. So if you look farther away, you're seeing a bigger volume. And so you can use that to learn about the, the evolution of the cosmos as a whole and, and what it's made of. So cosmologists, uh, they're, Cosmology study like encompasses a huge range of different kinds of topics and different kinds of working, uh, but the the fundamental thing we're trying to figure out is just how the universe works. Yeah, it sounded so comprehensive that what's outside of cosmology? What does that leave out if the entire universe and its evolution <laughs> and um, well. Well, I mean, in in astrophysics, uh, things outside of cosmology would be stuff, stuff like stellar astrophysics, so learning about how stars work, 
or um, high energy astrophysics, uh, things like studying supernovae and um, extreme objects like neutron stars, uh, or planetary astrophysics, if you study how planet, uh, planetary systems form and, and how those work. Um, and then, you know, there's a whole range of other things. A lot of people right. study the workings of our own galaxy, so galactic astrophysics, okay. and that would be... So you said, like um, you said, the big picture yeah. um, is it. So um, we'll come back to uh, some stuff specific about your research and um, and your interest in public outreach uh, with science communication. Um, for people who don't know, um, uh, Katie is very active in particular on, on Twitter and her handle is at Astro Katie. So go follow her there. I'm at Science Comedian if you want to give me a follow. <laughs> and the topic today is not the beginning of the universe, but the end of the universe. Yeah. And although that's not specifically maybe your area of concentration, it's a subject you've been giving a lot of thought to the past couple of years. And yeah. it culminates in the release of your first book for the public, which is yeah. coming out in just a few weeks in yeah, early yeah, August. Yeah. And it's called, very appropriately, the end of everything, <laughs> astrophysically speaking. So yeah. that's pretty exciting. We had to we had to put the astrophysically speaking on there so people would know that we're we're really serious. <laughs> like we really, <laughs> we really mean the end of everything. Absolutely everything. Not um, just the end of the earth, no, which might no. come along in a few a couple or few billion years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is this is my I have an early copy of the book. This is what it looks like. Nice. Um, I, I I get a kick out of the kind of trippy cover. Um, Space time. Yeah. It, it's uh yeah. So my my I've, I've I've been interested in you know the the evolution of the universe, uh, how it changes over time, all of that for a long time, and I've done a lot of research on the beginning of the universe, but uh, there hasn't you know there's there's not as much talk about the end, right? Um, in the in the literature, uh, there's there's good reasons why we don't write as many papers about the end of the universe as we do about the beginning. Um, and I noticed that there aren't that many books about the end of the universe. There are a couple, but it's it's not as well. Uh, covered as the beginning. And so I thought it would be fun hmm. to write a book that goes through several different possibilities for what the end of the universe would look like, how we're trying to figure it out, what are some possibilities for which way it might go. Um, and uh, it's been it's been so much fun to, um, <laughs> to study this. And I know that there's something probably a little pathological about enjoying it quite that much. But you know, it's, it's fun it's to great. laugh about. It's so funny yeah. to, to, I've watched you, uh, as you describe some of the things we're going to talk about, some of the specific ways that I've seen like this smile grow on your face <laughs> as you get to something that it's about the end of the universe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, it's fun because you get to deal with these, you know, just huge destructive forces, you know, uh, way bigger than we can possibly imagine. And, and, uh, and so it's, it's kind of, it's this sort of weirdly scary, but also so, you know, abstract and far off that you don't really have to worry about it. Um, but it is, it is fun. The idea that, you know, maybe the universe will be ripped apart. <laughs> like, what right. does that even mean? That's awesome. Uh, and, and it's also fun because you can get, you can get to, to, to very different ends of the universe with just very small tweaks to the equations, you know, just a little bit like if the data is just slightly different over here, then you go from a universe that kind of just cools down to it forever to one that's actually ripped apart. Or, you know, you have a lot of other possibilities that have to do with, you know, weird things that can happen in particle physics. And it gets, you know, so it gets, it gets very, uh, you know, you get very different answers very quickly with very small changes to what we think we know about the cosmos. And so I find that really fun. And, it's also fun to write about because I get to throw in a lot of really interesting in-depth kind of physics topics with, you know, I, I'm not, the book is not a physics book. It's not um, a textbook. It's really, I've written it for, for a general audience. Um, but it is fun to, to try to get across some of these really technical ideas in an accessible way so that uh, I can share uh, this fun stuff with everybody. Yeah, so this uh, this discussion uh, of the end of the universe is a great framework to add this other information about the physics. Um, although, like you yeah. said, it's it it is for the layperson. It's it's 
it's readable by anyone. And in the book, uh, you basically discuss the five five likely candidates, uh, five yeah. different ways the universe might end. But did you have to narrow that down? Were there other possibilities that maybe just seem less likely that you didn't entertain in the book? Yeah, I mean, so the five I chose were, I, I chose them based on things that people actually write papers about. So they're, you know, they're not, you know, they're, they're really legitimate theories about, about what might happen. And I wanted to choose a range where it looks really different. Um, so for example, one of the one of the possibilities I talk about in the book is uh, bouncing cosmologies or cyclic cosmologies. And there are a lot of different ways you can get the universe to you know go in uh, cycles from beginning to end over and over again. Um, so I, I kind of condensed several of those into one chapter, but I didn't give a different chapter to each. Uh, each of those different possibilities, even though some of them look really different in terms of what the universe is actually doing in between the you know start and end, uh, I I tried to I tried to keep each each of the five scenarios pretty different, you know, really different uh, kind of phenomena, and I also chose them based on what would be you know what would be the best vehicle to talk about cool physics and cool astrophysics and like you know stuff about the expansion of the universe or the Big Bang or uh, weird particle physics, you know, quantum mechanics phenomena that, that uh, you know, just can do your head in. So I, I chose based on what was most, most talked about, most likely, and, you know, most fun, basically. I have a question from the chat that might can, that I don't fully understand it, but maybe it connects to what I just wanted to ask you. I was just going to ask, um, Okay, so the universe begins with the Big Bang, but does the universe, does it necessarily end? Does it have to end? Yeah. And this more specific question says, what's the latest regarding the endless universe theory of Steinhardt and Turok? Right, yeah. So uh, that's that's a reference to uh, what's called the ekpyrotic model of the universe. And, and I'll, t I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, uh, it's called they call it an endless universe because there are these cycles. And so you, you get a, a, a new beginning and a new end over and over again. So in some sense it doesn't end, but um, the, I would say, if you ask me if, if the universe going to end, I would say yes. And the reason I would say that is because, okay, we know the universe had a beginning and we know it's been changing over time. And we know that everything in our sort of observable volume of space will be destroyed. Like none of the none of the options for the end of the universe that I discuss in my book are options where everything's going to be okay. <laughs> like it's just <laughs> it's just it's not gonna it's not gonna end well. Like uh, there, every one of these scenarios involves all of the structure in the, in our observable uh, region of the cosmos being completely destroyed in some very you know final manner um, and whether or not that leads to a new beginning that depends on the model so some of these scenarios you do get a new beginning some of these scenarios are part of the universe is not the whole universe and there's regions outside um, our observable universe that might carry on um, and so it doesn't mean just because our observable universe will end doesn't mean that there aren't some spaces out there that might carry on past that ending but um but when we talk about the universe as cosmologists, we're usually talking about the observable universe, which is like the volume of space that we can even in principle learn anything about. And, um, and that, that volume of space, everything in it will be destroyed or you know, changed beyond recognition, at least uh, at some date in the future. So that's, I would call that an end of the universe, but um, you know, <laughs> there are these models where you do have these cycles and you know, so that's one of the, that's an endless. example of the kind of cyclical thing yeah. that you were talking about. Yeah. So, so the, the, um, what, what's being asked about, uh, this endless universe idea. So, uh, Paul Steinhardt, who was my PhD advisor and Neil Turok, who until recently was the director of the perimeter Institute where I'm, where I'm at now. Um, they, they came up, uh, with, uh, you know, them and, and some colleagues came up with a model of the universe in which, um, it cycles from, from Big Bang to a kind of big crunch over and over again. And they wrote a book called Endless Universe, that uh, a popular book that 
that uh, summarizes this this model. And the, that model has been changing over the years. So what it looks like now in terms of if you ask Paul Steinhardt now what his, uh, you know, what the model actually does, it'll be very different from what the original idea was. But the original idea was that you had sort of two parallel universes um, that were, uh, that are, you know, so we have our our universe is is one of these universes. Is this you know three dimensions of space, one dimension of time, um, and it's in some larger space that has a, an extra dimension, a higher dimension of space. And on the other side of that higher dimension of space is another three dimensional of universe. You know, three dimensions of space, one of time. Um, and these two universes could collide with each other, and that collision is a starts a new big bang. And so the, the way that this model works is that you have these two parallel universes. There may or may not be something on the other universe or in the other universe, but it's, it's sort of separated from us by this dimension of space that we can't perceive. And then as, it come, as they come together, um, that kind of creates some, some uh, seeds of structure. And then they create a, they have a big bang and then they separate apart. They each do their own expansion in their own spaces, and then eventually they come together again. And so you have this, this kind of endless clapping <laughs> of these two <laughs> parallel universes. Um, and that's, that's the original uh, so-called ekpyrotic model. But now, uh, if, you, if you talk to them, there, there's been tweaks to this, and you don't necessarily have to have higher dimensions. You don't necessarily have to have another universe, but it does go through this cycle of, some contraction and then a, a new uh, big bang phase. You know, it's pretty challenging for the non-scientist or non-mathematician to know what to make of this talk of other dimensions. Is that mm -hmm. real? Is that just a mathematical thing? Or well, like, what, what does it even mean for yeah, there to be other yeah. dimensions like that? Well, so when we talk about dimensions as physicists or mathematician, we're talking about um, sort of the extent in space of space, right? So we live in three dimensions. We have up, down, left, right, forward, backward, right? Those are our three dimensions. Um, and then we sometimes talk about time being a fourth dimension. Uh, if you if you think about things as a, a in terms of Einstein's general relativity or special relativity, this makes sense. Uh, if you're used to thinking of time as just something that passes, it gets a little confusing. But um, but basically, when we talk about extra dimensions, we're talking about extra dimensions of space, meaning that there would be some other dimension, some other direction uh, that one could, in principle, move through space in that's perpendicular to every one of the directions we have. So, you know, left to right is perpendicular to up down. <laughs> uh, forward backward is perpendicular to both left right and up down. Now, take right angles to all of those. That that's we can't really where do i that. where do i look i don't know right, where to look. right yeah and we're we're three-dimensional species and it's very hard to imagine a fourth spatial dimension but mathematically it's a perfectly reasonable thing to do and so if there is another dimension of space then that that could you know, you know give you some freedom to to do more interesting things in terms of the physics and and there's no reason to think that we can't have higher dimensions of space now we can do certain kinds of experiments that can can you know sort of place constraints on that and say like if there is a higher dimension of space then there's some you know there, there's some limit to how big it could be and the the way that we place constraints on that is the fact that in all these theories, gravity can move between all of the dimensions. So even though we can't move in this extra direction, gravity can. And so the idea is that if gravity can leak out into this higher dimension of space that we can't perceive, then the gravity that we measure is a little bit less uh, because some of that gravity is getting out to this other space. So we can do experiments on gravity to to learn about this potential higher dimension of space. And so we can put sort of limits on it, but is, there's still a possibility that there are other dimensions out there that there are, you know, that we could have several additional directions that we can't perceive. And that, and that comes up in things like string theory. But, um, but so far there's no evidence for these additional dimensions. And, and I know that when people uh, who are not physicists talk about dimensions, they often talk about like a spiritual dimension or something like that. 
And that's not what we're talking about. It would just be a direction in space. It would just be ordinary space, but that space is, you know, extends in another direction. And there's not necessarily anything particularly interesting over there. It's just that we can't, uh, we can't go in that direction. We can't perceive anything in that direction. If time, if it's valid to consider time as a dimension, is it weird that that we have these three known dimensions of space, but only one of time? Can there be other dimensions of time? Instead of just moving forward and backwards, could there be other dimensions of time? Is that something that physicists address? Yeah. Every once in a while, you see a paper that has uh, another time-like dimension. And the, the, the constraints on, like, the way that space-time works, if you have, like, space-time works differently in the time dimension than in the spatial dimensions. It's, it's, uh, it has to do with kind of how they interact with each other. And so you can have weird things happen if you have additional dimensions of time. But usually we only, we stick with the one. Um, but yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's it's really about how the dimensions, like how things change um, mathematically if you, if you sort of manipulate that space yeah. time. And so so the reason that we want the reason we use dimension to talk about time at all is because in Einstein's um, idea of space time, um, space and time are connected to each other in the sense that moving through one affects how you move through the other. And so if you're moving very quickly through space, then your, your time is moving more slowly. And, and space is something that can be warped by the presence of mass. And that also makes time move more slowly if you're near, if you're in that warped, uh, you know, curved space. And so the, you have to have a, a framework where there, these these things are linked together, and so I imagine it as kind of a grid where the spatial dimensions are are you know some dim directions of the grid, and then the time dimension is another direction in the grid. And so as you warp one of them, it warps the other one too, and and so they're all kind of tied in together. Excellent. So let's discuss the ways the universe can end or may end. I don't know what how you prefer to, to describe it. And is, is there anything, before we discuss actual scenarios, is there any other bit of uh, like foundation that, that you want to get to before we jump into one of the um, scenarios? Well, I mean, we could talk about the beginning because I think, it, so, so if you're going to talk about the end, it's, it's helpful to also talk about the beginning because um, the these things are connected because if we if we really knew how the beginning worked um then we we would have hints about uh what the the fundamental workings of the universe and thus how the end will come about so we often we often talk about these things together so people who work on early universe theory that's the theory of the very beginning of the universe often work on things also that connect to the very end of the universe because they're both these kind of extreme ends of this uh, this whole story. Um, so the the thing that's the most fascinating thing about the beginning of the universe is that we can actually see it. Okay, so we can see into the past. We can see the the early stages of our own cosmos just by looking far away. So when you look at a distant galaxy, you're looking into the past. When you look at anything, you're looking into the past. So. If you look at the moon, you're looking at a little over a second ago. So you see the moon as it was a little over a second ago because it takes a little over a second for the light to get from the moon to you. And so you see it as it was in the past. If you look at the sun, which you should only do with you know proper eye protection, uh, but if you look at the sun, you're looking at about eight minutes ago. If you look at a distant star, you might be looking at thousands of years ago. And if you look at other galaxies, you're looking at billions of years ago. And now we know that the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. So if you look at really, really distant things, you're looking at deeper and deeper into the early times of the universe. And we can look so far away that we see parts of the universe that are still, from our perspective, experiencing the last stages of the Big Bang. So we think that the, the Big Bang, the, the way the universe started was that there was something happened, and that's something we don't know, and that's that gets real complicated real fast, but something happened. And then the universe was this extremely hot, dense 
state. So the whole the whole universe was hot and dense. It was filled with radiation, and then as it expanded, it cooled, and the um, and the the fire, you know, the plasma cooled down and separated, and you know, you had uh, atoms forming, and then eventually gas clouds came together and formed stars and galaxies and everything we see today. But that that primordial fire, that that hot stage of the universe, we can see that directly because if we look far enough away, we look at points in the universe that are so far away that they are still glowing with that heat. And we can see that radiation as, as those parts of the universe are still sort of cooling down from that initial sort of inferno stage. So we can learn a lot about the very beginning of the universe because we can actually see it. And in every direction we look, we see this background light um, of this afterglow of the Big Bang. So, so looking into the past, looking at the beginning of the universe is very direct. We can, we can actually see it. But when we look into the future, when we try and learn about the, the end of the universe, we have to extrapolate from what we know about the evolution of the universe, from what we know about how the universe works. And the way we do that is we look at how the universe has been changing over time since the beginning, which is mostly expansion and cooling and, and you know, galaxies forming and stars forming and all of that. And then we extrapolate and say, okay, what's going to happen next? If it's been doing this expansion and cooling until now, where does it go next? Does the expansion continue forever? Does it, does it stop and turn around? Um, does the expansion speed up? Uh, what are the other things that could come in and happen that could alter this picture? So that's kind of where we start when we're thinking about the end of the universe is this question of how can we extrapolate what we know from the beginning to now into the future? Interesting. Um, so we know some stuff about the beginning of the universe. Some stuff remains unknown. Are there, what's the most significant quest, m mystery or question that you'd like the answer to about the beginning of the universe? Ooh, um, I think that the most significant question I think about the beginning of the universe, uh, you, you ask different people, you'll get different answers. But from my perspective is the question of cosmic inflation and whether or not that happened. So um, when I say something happened at the beginning, um, we don't know what that something is. A lot of people talk about a singularity so there's this idea that the universe started in a singularity, which is a, a sort of point of infinite density. We don't know if there was an infinite density stage at the beginning of the universe. Um, and one of the reasons we don't know that is because we think that, that, you know, sort of after that, if that even happened, there was this very rapid expansion phase. And this was called inflation, where the universe went from very, very small to a whole lot bigger <laughs> over a very short amount of time. Um, and it did this sort of exponential expansion. And it went it, and that magnified a very small region of the universe to our entire observable universe that we see today. Um, and there are good reasons to think that inflation might have happened based on sort of patterns we see in the, the sort of contents and structure of the cosmos and the shape of, of space in our universe and all of that. But we don't know for sure that it happened. Um, if it did happen, it's very hard to know what happened before it because uh, whatever the universe was doing, if inflation happened, it kind of zoomed in on just one tiny little piece of the larger universe that existed before. And so it's very hard to extrapolate before that, like what, you know, what happened before that little tiny, you know, little tiny piece. It's like, it's kind of like if you, um, you know, if somebody sent you a, um, a close up photo of like a square millimeter of a painting and then asked you to extrapolate, like, what was it a picture of? It's a very hard thing to do. And the, and the, the way inflation worked is we think there could have been this very complicated, you know, um, universe with lots of lots of different structure in it or something. And, and it, what inflation did is it kind of zoomed in on one little piece of that complicated picture and, and took that, you know, and, and, and blew that up to be the whole universe. So our universe is very uniform, even though the early stages of the universe might not have been. Um, but that means that, you know, we, we lose all that structure that, that might've been there before. So 
we're trying to figure out if inflation really did happen. And there are, there are clues we can look for. We've been, been looking for these clues. Um, one, one of the clues is uh, something called primordial gravitational waves. And there are experiments looking for that. That's sort of ripples in space time that, that occurred during this, this expansion of the universe. Um, and a few years ago, uh, there was an experiment called BICEP2 that, that thought they detected these things. And then it turned out, you know, probably they didn't. And so we're still looking for that kind of proof uh, or, or very strong evidence that, that inflation occurred. We have good reasons to believe it might have because we see, uh, you know, the pattern of, of galaxies in the sky, the pattern in the cosmic microwave background, this background light of the universe fits very well to this idea that inflation occurred. But, you know, we don't know for sure. And if it didn't occur, uh, there are some of the other ideas for, for how we got the universe we have today link into some of these ideas about the end of the universe. So specifically some of these cyclic models where you have, you know, kind of a contracting phase and then a, and then a new expansion that can, that those, some of those ideas can also lead to the kinds of things we see in the cosmos today. And there's sort of alternative ideas to uh, the inflation scenario. Before we jump into the specific scenarios, uh, I have a couple questions from the chat. One is, okay. how do the slightly different estimates of the age of the universe affect your work? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So um, there's a... Uh, okay, so this comes into the question of how do we measure the expansion of the universe? And um, when we... so. One of the things we want to know if we're going to extrapolate to the end of the universe is how quickly is the universe expanding? And there, there are several reasons we want to know this. Um, this is going to be a long answer, but I'll get to, <laughs> I'll get to the age question in a bit. Um, several reasons we want to know the, the expansion speed of the universe. And one of them is because it relates to this question of, is the universe going to recollapse? Okay, so, so we know that the universe started smaller and denser and it's been expanding since the beginning. And we also know that everything in the universe has gravity. So that, so all the things in the universe are kind of trying to slow down the expansion. Like they're, they're, they're being pulled apart by the expansion of the space in between them, but they're also gravitating and they kind of want to come back together. And so that, that's a kind of, a, that applies a break to the expansion of the universe. And so in the late nineties, astronomers wanted to find out like, is there enough gravity in the universe that it will recollapse? Or is there so much expansion from the initial kind of kick of the Big Bang that things will just keep, you know, flowing out and uh, drifting away forever? Um, Maybe slower and slower, but right. continuing. Exactly. And it should be slowing down all the time because, you know, that gravity is applying that break. And so either either it's, it's kind of slowing down in a measurable way all the time or the initial kick was so big that it's, it's just sort of coasting and the gravity is not that important. But either way, you know, it's either slowing down or it's kind of just steady. Um, sort of like if you, if you take a ball and you throw it up into the air, um, there, there are only a couple of things that can happen. You know, either you throw it up into the air, you give it a little bit of a kick, it, it goes up for a while, stops and falls down again because the gravity overcomes your initial sort of push. Or if you throw it really hard, like inhumanly hard, in principle, it can escape the Earth's gravity um, and it'll kind of be slowing down all this time, but it, it will keep going forever, right? It'll, it'll go off into space and just continue. Um, and so those were kind of the possibilities we thought of for the universe. And we were trying to measure the so-called deceleration parameter. How quickly is the expansion of the universe slowing down? And in the late 1990s, they measured this number and they found it was negative, which means that the, it wasn't decelerating at all. It was accelerating. So the expansion of the universe was speeding up, which is super weird. It's about as weird as if you throw that ball in the, up, up in the air, it slows down for a little while and then shoots off into space you know, and you haven't done anything. <laughs> um, and that seems to be what's happened with the universe. It was slowing down for the first 9 billion years or so. The expansion was slowing down. And then around 5 billion years ago, the expansion started speeding up. And oh, we know that, that the expansion was slowing down? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, can measure, we can measure how the expansion rate has changed over time. And mm. we can see that it was slower and, it's been, and it, was, it was slowing and it's been speeding up. Um, so, yeah, so we can see where that transition happened based on, on studying the, the motions of very, very, very distant things. And yeah, and so, so we know the universe is speeding up in its expansion, which, 
which suggests that it's not going to collapse again. So uh, I'll get to that, that the big crunch and, and the heat so up and that all that. Is, and that's one of your scenarios. That, that's yeah. when, if it does slow down and collapse, that, that's the big crunch. Yeah, yeah. So, so finding out the universe was speeding up in its expansion was something that made us think probably the big crunch isn't going to happen. Because in the 60s or so, the big crunch was thought to be the most likely scenario. Um, but, uh, but then, you know, and then other measurements were made and other ideas came up. And then when, when it found, we found out the universe was actually getting faster, <laughs> like the expansion was speeding up, like it's very hard to see how that turns around <laughs> and, and the big crunch wins out. In the but end. if it was slowing down before and then speeding up, could it not reverse again and go back well, to Well, this slowing? is the thing. So we don't know what's making the universe expand faster. We don't know why the acceleration is occurring. We call whatever it is that's making that acceleration occur dark energy. We call it dark energy because we do not know what it is and we cannot see it. And uh, we think it might be something called a cosmological constant, which is a kind of just property of space that makes space want to expand sort of it, 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 it sort of imbues all all of space with a little bit of stretchiness that kind of you know does this expansion um and i'll, I'll talk about that a little bit uh more in detail later but um you know that that's we that's why we think that the universe is not going to recollapse is because there's there's it's being driven by this dark energy it's expanding faster and faster but we don't know what dark energy is so if it's not a cosmological constant it could be something that could cause a turnaround. We don't really know. Um, but anyway, so so that's why that kind of those kinds of questions are why we want to know how quickly the universe is expanding. And also, if we know how quickly the universe is expanding and we know how old it is and how the expansion has changed over time, then we can extrapolate from that how like we can extrapolate when the universe started by um, by knowing how quickly it's expanding now and how that expansion rate has been changing over time. So if you have different expansion rates now, that gives you different ages of the universe, right? Um, and for a long time, we seemed to be kind of coming to an agreement about what the expansion rate of the universe was and thus what the age of the universe was. Uh, through different observations, you get some numbers and, and they seem to be agreeing. But right now we're in a situation where those numbers are not agreeing anymore. So there are a couple of different ways to measure the expansion rate of the universe. Um, and at the moment, there's there seem to be irreconcilable differences between those different ways of measuring. So one way is to just look at distant galaxies and see how quickly they they seem to be moving away from us, and that tells you fairly directly how quickly the universe is expanding. But the the reason that's tricky is because what we see is a speed, so we can see pretty directly how quickly things are moving away from us. And that's what, by by a redshift. Yeah, by the way, the light is stretched out as so. Is if something's moving away from you, its light gets kind of stretched out. So something that's moving away from you very quickly looks a little redder. If it's moving toward you very quickly, the light gets squished together and it makes it look bluer. That's because the wavelength of blue light is shorter. The wavelength of red light is longer. And so if you're kind of stretching these these photons, stretching that light out, um, that changes uh, the apparent color. Of, of objects. And so when we see distant things, we can see very directly how quickly they're moving through that, pro that property of the light, the red shifting of the light. But what's harder to figure out is the distance. And in order to get this measurement of the expansion rate of the universe, we need to know the distance too, not, not just the speed, but, but also the distance. And uh, that's hard because uh, you don't, you know, when you see a bright light in the sky, you don't necessarily know how far away it is, and you can't really like lay down meter sticks uh, to figure that out. And so we do a number of extrapolations from uh, more, you know, closer things, and then we use that to calibrate measurements of more distant things, and so on and so on. And it gets complicated real fast. Um, and so that distance question is 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 the hard part. But if you, you know, we do the best we can, we come up with estimates for the expansion of the rate from looking at specifically distant supernovae, uh, you know, exploding stars in other galaxies and using those as a way to measure distances and, um, and recession speeds. And we get some number for the expansion rate of the universe. And then we have other ways of measuring that involve looking at properties of that background light from the Big Bang. And based on looking at properties of the background light and then applying our understanding of how the universe has changed over time, 
we get another estimate for the current expansion rate. And just those two things don't agree. And there are a few other things you can do involving gravitational lenses and involving uh, like statistics of galaxies. And it gets, it gets complicated again real fast, but the, the basic disagreement is that if you measure based on studying things that happened in the early universe and then applying cosmology and getting a number for today versus if you study th things about the current expansion based on looking at the recession speeds and you know applying a whole bunch of uh, calibrations of distance, you just get different answers. And the, um, the one from supernovae gives you a faster current expansion speed, which gives you a younger universe. And the one from the early universe gives you a slower current expansion speed and therefore an older universe. And it's, it's unclear at the moment how to resolve that question. So Is there interest in trying to find a third method to see if that would... There are, there are lots of methods, yeah. So there have been a few other, a few other methods proposed. You can even uh, try and uh, figure this out through studying things about gravitational waves, which are these ripples in space-time. Um, but unfortunately, you know, there, there's been no agreement so far. Like there, there've been, there've been some methods that give you an answer right in the middle, but with, you know, some <laughs> uncertainty. So it's not clear if it agrees better with either side. Um, and depending on how you analyze the data, uh, what kinds of sort of assumptions you make, you just get different answers. And so it's, it's a very complicated uh, area of research right now. And there are, uh, very heated discussions <laughs> that go on uh, in the literature and in conferences and um, in you know email chains and all of this and, and that makes uh, one wonder what does a heated discussion look like between astrophysicists, <laughs> <laughs> theoretical well, astrophysicists know, having I mean, a heated the, discussion. The thing is, you know, astrophysics is done by people just like everything else, and you know, uh, we get we get invested sometimes in our in our ideas in our. Uh, assumptions or in our observations and and so people do you know uh get offended if you if you question their their data sometimes or i mean that that stuff can happen or if you if you suggest something that maybe they've missed something in their analysis that can happen um most of the time i mean you know there have been very few instances that i've encountered of people being really really mean uh in astrophysics uh, but you know we do have heated like you know rigorous debate so yeah. people, people, you know, we want to find the answer, right? Like we want, like, like there are sort of two things, right? We want to find the answer. Also, we want to be right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and hopefully the first one of those things wins. Uh, but, um, you know, both of them are, are things that happen because we're people and because we, we have, you know, uh, we get invested in these questions. And so that, that, but that kind of rigorous debate, that kind of, um, you know, back and forth is what helps us to make sure we do get to the right answer. Because if you do have, I mean, the, the whole idea behind the scientific method is that you have everybody's checking everybody else's work, right? And if you are really invested in an answer, uh, then you're going to check the the work that gives the other answer really carefully and vice versa. And you, you just hope that that all balances out. And so far, I think, you know, in this question, we have a lot of really interesting discussion on all sides. And I do think that we will, you know, come to some agreement uh, eventually where we all understand, you know, what all the issues are. But the there are some cool possibilities, and one of them is that that our understanding of how cosmology works over time is is missing something, right? So there could be something that happened in the early universe that means that our extrapolation of uh, cosmology from the you know background light to today is missing some important element. And this disagreement could be the thing that tells us that that important element is missing. And it could be weird uh, ways that dark matter works, new kinds of neutrinos, um, strange events that might've happened at the beginning of the universe, um, you know, even you know, weird activity of dark energy or whatever. There are lots of different possibilities for what could explain that disagreement by saying, you know, actually both measurements are right, but our assumptions about cosmology are wrong. So we're still we're still trying to figure that all out. On a on a non-technical, more like human level, uh, is it is that uh, tension that discrepancy between those two methods is that frustrating? Or you actually just said something to suggest that it's that thing that I 
said this week a couple of times that I love about scientists, that scientists actually enjoy problems and challenges more than most oh, people, yeah. I think. So is it the fact that these don't disagree? What's your human reaction to that? Is that cool and interesting or is it frustrating? It's, you know, it's, it's an anomaly and we are desperate for anomalies in, in physics and cosmology. Like we, we really want to find places where uh, the data do not agree with our initial assumptions or our theory, because, because that's what tells us where to go next, right? There's actually, we have a big problem in both particle physics and cosmology right now, which is that in, in both of those areas, we have pretty good descriptions of our results, our experimental results, our observational results that seem to fit all the data really well. And that's bad because we also know that these descriptions we have of all of you know the theories cannot be the whole picture, partially because they kind of don't agree with each other. So, so on the one hand, you have particle physics. So in particle physics, you have the standard model of particle physics, which is a, a theory that kind of puts together all of the particles we've ever, we've ever detected in laboratories and uh, has some, you know, some description of how they fit together and how they interact with each other with the forces of nature. And that theory um, explains everything we've seen in experiments to a reasonable level of accuracy. There are a few anomalies and experiments here and there. Those are very exciting. Um, but so far, nothing has come up that's, that's been like, that cannot fit with the standard model of particle physics. Neutrinos are the, first, are the only thing that, that people would say, you know, we have detected something that doesn't fit with the standard model because in the original standard model, neutrinos didn't have mass. And we know now that neutrinos do have mass, but uh, it's fairly easy to tweak the standard model to put mass in for neutrinos. And so the standard model fits all the data, works well in the experiments, but it doesn't include, for example, dark matter. And we're pretty sure dark matter is out there because the astrophysical observations tell us that there's some extra stuff out there in the universe that is uh, something that has mass, that collects where, where galaxies are, that holds you know, structure in the universe together, and it's probably some kind of new particle that's just not part of the standard model of particle physics. So we know the standard model is incomplete. It also doesn't have a good description of gravity in there. We know that you know, something has to come in to mess with it, to make gravity work, to make dark matter work, maybe dark energy. So we know it's incomplete, but it fits all the data, which is frustrating. Because if it, if it didn't fit some of the data, then we'd say, aha, that's where the new physics comes in. That's where we have to adjust our models. Okay. Um, but so far, it's, it's, it's frustratingly solid. And then on the same time, we have uh, cosmology. And cosmology has what's called concordance cosmology, which is this beautiful picture where we have, you know, most of the universe is made of dark energy. And then after that, most of the rest is dark matter. And then there's this little sort of 5% slice of the universe. That's all of the stuff that we can see and interact with and everything that's in the standard model, you know, particles and people and planets and galaxies and so on. Um, and in this picture of concordance cosmology, we have, you know, that inflation happened in the beginning, the universe is expanding. It's made of dark matter, dark energy and, and regular matter. Um, and we have, and it's ruled by general relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity. And that all, that works with every observation we've ever done, but we don't know what dark matter is. We don't know what dark energy is. We don't know for sure that inflation happened. And we're pretty sure that whatever, that, that, that Einstein's general relativity cannot explain um, gravity ultimately, that there's going to be something that comes in to change our picture of gravity. We're pretty sure about that because gravity and quantum mechanics don't fit well together. So probably there's some, you know, wiggle room in there, but every experiment we've done fits perfectly well with general relativity. <laughs> and so, so discrepancies, it's... that's really interesting. Discrepancies yeah. are really useful to show yeah. you where to focus your attention. Yeah, we're desperate for a discrepancy because the only way <laughs> that we come up with new theories is to find where the current theory is no longer valid. Because what you want to do is every, every time you come up with a new theory, you want it to be something that fits all the data we have, but then also explains something that the current, that the current theory cannot explain, right? So uh, for example, going from Newton's theory of gravity to Einstein's theory of gravity, Newton's theory of gravity works really well for a ball rolling down a hill, you know, the moon orbiting the, the, the earth, um, you know, everything we know about how things move in our daily lives. But Newton's theory of gravity does not work for things that are moving extremely quickly. It doesn't work for the gravity really close to the sun or, you know, the gravity near a black hole. 
um, those kinds of things don't work well with Newton's theory, uh, but they do work in general relativity in Einstein's theory. And so Einstein's theory explains all the stuff on Earth and these extreme scenarios where Newton's theory breaks down. So what we really want is in both cosmology and in physics, we want a theory where it explains everything we've measured with all of our telescopes and all of our experiments, and also some new thing that we've measured that doesn't fit with that theory. But we need that new thing <laughs> so that we know so that we know which direction to go. We know what what the new theory has to include. And so far, you know, it's very hard to find that new thing. Every once in a while, there's a little anomaly, you know, so um, some little data point that doesn't seem to fit with the current models. So, for example, you know, the uh, xenon one ton uh, dark matter detector experiment saw a little blip recently that may or may not be some new kind of uh, dark matter. And we're, we're really hoping that that's new physics, but we don't know yet. It could be statistical fluctuation. It could be some kind of, you know, uh, radioactivity in the detector. We're not sure, but we hope that's something real because that would tell us where to go next with particle physics. And at the same time, we don't know if this, you know, this expansion rate thing is a problem with the data analysis or a real discrepancy, but we hope it's a real discrepancy because that could tell us that there's new physics in the universe and tell us where to go next in our in our theories. So we love uh, anomalies. <laughs> we love yeah. disagreements. New, you know, some data that just, just cannot fit with our with our current models. Yeah. Um, we don't want to be, I mean, we want to be right, but we don't want to have already been right about everything because we know we we know that that like that just doesn't give us anywhere to go. Cool. Um, let's jump into a scenario. Um, I, I, let me ask you what, what order, how do you want to approach this? Do you want to start with like less likely ways that the universe will end? Sure. Sure. Um, we don't so, want to I jump mean, to the most likely one. Well, what's, <laughs> yeah. So you, you discussed, do you want to tell us the, the scenarios yeah, that you discuss uh, in your book? I'll, yeah, I'll tell I'll tell you about all five, and I'll go in order of the book because it's kind of a it's a useful order. It makes sense. In. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, I already sort of talked a little bit about the first one, the big crunch. So this is just the idea that the expansion of the universe could reverse, and then all these galaxies that seem to be moving away from us really quickly could suddenly start moving toward us very quickly, um, and uh, that would be an interesting way to go. Uh, so the way, so what people usually assume about the big crunch is that the reason that's bad is because galaxies will, you know, come and, and collide with us. Um, but galaxies colliding is not necessarily a death sentence. So we actually know that there is a galaxy coming for us right now. Uh, it's called the Andromeda Galaxy, and it will. Uh, it's it's a large galaxy uh, around the same size as the, as our Milky Way galaxy, maybe ten times bigger, somewhere in there. Um, and it's uh, it's coming toward us at 110 kilometers per second, and it'll arrive in about 4 billion years. And when that happens, uh, the galaxies will come together. The, uh, the stars in each galaxy will get kind of thrown around by these gravitational encounters with other stars from the other galaxy. The gas in the two galaxies will come together, and that'll create a few new stars as, as the gas comes together, and you get a little burst of star formation. Not a big burst, but a little bit. Um, and the black holes in the centers of each galaxy will, will collide with each other eventually and make a bigger black hole. So each of us has a supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy, and those will come together and collide. Um, but that won't necessarily hurt the solar system per se, because the chance that two stars collide in this uh, scenario is tiny. Uh, because there's just so much empty space, even in a galaxy, even when galaxies collide with each other head on. There's just so much empty space. That That's so hard to wrap your mind around. We think yeah. like the, the sun is like has a, a volume, a million times more volume than the earth a million times. Mm -hmm. And then, but those distances between stars yeah. are so fast. Huh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, our nearest star is four light years away. I and mean, that's, and that's the a nearest. huge amount of space. Yeah, it's a huge amount of space in between stars. So the chance of stars colliding is very small. And so, you know, when our when our galaxy collides with the Milky Way, the Earth won't be with doing Andromeda. well because or, sorry, with Andromeda, yeah, the Earth will not be doing well because it'll already have been baked by the sun and it might have fallen <laughs> in or something. Like it'll be bad. Like the Earth will not be around, but but the solar system itself will be basically fine. 
Um, the thing that, that, that's bad about a big crunch is not just galaxies colliding, although when you get enough of them together, it does get dicey. Um, the, the worst thing about the big crunch is that not only are you, are you compressing all the space that for, and, and therefore compressing the matter, you're also compressing, compressing the radiation. So all that background radiation that's, that's around from the Big Bang, from the sort of afterglow of the Big Bang, that radiation has been stretched out by the expansion of space, has been redshifted, so it's now microwave radiation, which is not harmful in any way. Low so energy. Universe, it's been stretched really out and, and dissipated. So, yeah, so it, it was big. high energy at the time of the Big Bang, yeah. and by stretching it out, it's cooled and it's yeah. lower energy. Yeah. Yeah, it's this low so. energy background. But when you start <laughs> to compress the universe, yeah, it, it gets to be higher energy. It gets to be harder radiation, mm. and that gets uncomfortable. But then <laughs> even worse than that, not only is there this background radiation floating around, but also all of the light from all of the stars that have ever shown, all of the, the high energy radiation from the areas around black holes or, or neutron stars or, or you know, all of these kinds of high energy situations, all that light gets compressed too. And that can be really, that can be, that's already hotter and harder radiation than that. You compress that and you get this universe that's full of this extremely hard radiation, this extremely hmm. hot universe. And so space itself gets hot. That's, you know, what? because I didn't, okay, so I didn't consider that. And I was thinking, because anticipating something that's the opposite uh, in another mm -hmm. scenario is that in one way, like for an observer that uh, astronomy would get better because all these distant objects would get closer. So suddenly yeah. the night sky could be so, but I didn't realize. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the night sky gets real bright. <laughs> Not Maybe there's a, a sweet way. spot where you're like, this is a golden age of astronomy yeah. right before everything gets really uncomfortably hot. Yeah, yeah. And and the um, you know, in the in the 1960s, uh, an astronomer called uh, Martin Rees, uh, who's now the astronomer royal of, of England, of the UK, um, he he calculated that the thing that kills you in the big crunch scenario is that that radiation comes in and it eventually actually like ignites the surfaces of stars like it's so hot that you get <laughs> thermonuclear reactions happening across the whole surfaces of stars. instead of just in the core yeah yeah, yeah. so you you get reactions on the surface and so the stars get like ripped apart that's from the outside in and that's you, nothing survives <laughs> yeah. after that. so and, after and that, just is all over we don't have to spend any time on it but 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 you mentioned that this we're talking about the end of the universe, but the end of the earth is way sooner than that. Oh yeah. And we expect that that our sun will expand to a red giant and probably engulf the orbit of yeah. the earth. Well, we're so we're close so to it. Yes. Yeah, so so when our sun expands to be a red giant star, it'll definitely engulf Mercury and Venus. Um it may or may not get the earth. It won't it won't the edge of the red giant sun will not be as far out as the orbit of the earth, but in that process the earth orbit could be perturbed enough that it could fall in and then event, and then after that the sun sloughs off its outer layers and that could also um you know have the earth you know disturbed enough that it falls in so and uh just so i can enter it when do we expect that to happen i want to put uh, it in my around, calendar that's around five ish billion years four, five four, billion years. four or five billion years okay. um so yeah that process takes a while but but our the earth is has much less than time than that actually so, okay because because the thing that the thing that's uh that's dangerous for life on earth is not just the expansion of the sun but the fact that the sun's getting brighter and uh, it's getting brighter very slowly on human time scales it's not noticeable but over a billion years it'll get something like 10 percent brighter and that's enough that the that'll boil off the oceans of the earth so uh, in about a billion years, so, you know, give or take hundred million or a billion years, there will be, the earth will not be habitable in the, in the uh, astrophysical sense. It will not I be don't feel like I've heard that. I think I've always been thinking of the end of the earth as when the sun goes red giant, but I've always thought it's really amazing. It's astounding that, I mean, the only reason we're here and there's life on earth is because stars can be stable relatively mm -hmm. stable for yeah. billions of years so that yeah yeah, yeah, un yeah like you know relatively that. unchanging conditions so that we could evolve to this extent yeah 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 and that's why we don't expect to find uh planets with life on them around really giant stars because they mm. evolve so quickly that there wouldn't be time for life to evolve on those planets uh, before those stars uh, burn out 
but a, a star the size of the sun has a good long, you know, middle age where it right. can be bigger um, stars because they, it seems uh, contradictory uh, that a star that's more massive and has more fuel, it doesn't last longer because it's because it actually burns through it faster because it of its mass. Hotter. Yeah, it burns hotter. Yeah, yeah, it burns it, faster. Basically, yeah, basically with stars, I mean, this gets into some fun stellar astrophysics, but with stars, uh, the the reason that stars don't just immediately collapse on themselves is because they have this heat source in the inside, kind of like with a hot air balloon. You know, the hot air balloon, the hot air kind of keeps the balloon up, right? Um, so stars have this engine inside, this nuclear fusion uh, that creates power, it creates pressure and heat, and that keeps the star from, from falling on itself. But when you have more mass, you have to create more heat faster to keep the star from collapsing um, because you have more gravity pushing down, right? So if you're trying to balance a lot of gravity, you have to burn really hot, really fast. And so a really massive star, they have a little bit more fuel, but they burn through it so much faster that their lifetimes are much, much lower. So, you know, we're able apparently to talk for hours on end, but but we only have 90 minutes for this conversation. So um, so several decades ago, the big mm. crunch was a scenario considered to be a pretty to, to, to be one of the likely ends of the universe. Yeah. But yeah. now that we know about dark energy and the ex, the accelerating expansion of the universe, that's not considered very likely with what we know. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So once dark energy was discovered, once the accelerated expansion was discovered, the the new most likely scenario for the end of the universe became what's called the heat death. And this is the idea that over time, you know, the universe is expanding, it's speeding up in its expansion, and so everything's getting farther and farther away. And the ultimate end state of that is a universe that's very dark and cold and empty because as the expansion goes on it it it's that the universe is cooling the universe is getting more diffuse things are getting farther apart and so the all of the energy all the radiation and starlight and everything gets more diffuse and so space just gets colder right and um and one of the things that happens in this scenario is that because the universe is expanding so quickly and, and accelerating in its expansion, um, distant things get start to be so far away and moving away so quickly that light can't catch up in between them. So there are things that are being pulled away by the expansion of the universe such that the speed of light is faster, is, is you know, they're, they're moving away at the, more than the speed of light. And that's okay because they're not moving through space. It's the space in between that's expanding. So there's no speed limit on that. There are already things that we know are moving away from us faster than the speed of light because of the expansion of the universe. Um, but, but eventually that'll mean that we won't be able to see galaxies beyond our little bubble of space here. So we'll be able to see the galaxies that are you know, colliding with us like Andromeda, the sort of <laughs> local group of galaxies, but anything farther away, anything that's currently being pulled away by the expansion of space, we won't be able to see it anymore. So we only have, in that scenario, we only have about 100 billion years of extragalactic astronomy, <laughs> only about 100 so, billion yeah. years where we can see other galaxies. So we live in this great time because an observer yeah. in a far future like that wouldn't they would never be able to piece together what the universe is like if yeah. they can't even see any other galaxies right, so exactly yeah yeah, yeah. and so yeah and so you know when you get to that stage where you can't see other galaxies um the universe is expanding really quickly everything's kind of getting farther apart uh the universe just gets colder and darker and then then because there are no other galaxies around they can't collide with us and bring in new gas to make new stars so you stop having new stars forming and so then the stars that we have in our galaxy start to burn out and then uh you know so the stars are kind of burning out and fading away and then you know even black holes will start to evaporate so Stephen Hawking told us that that uh, black holes can evaporate; they can sort of lose mass over time by this kind of radiation. So the black holes will start to shrink, the stars will be dead, and then the matter will start to decay. And eventually, you'll end up with this universe that's basically just dark and empty and extremely cold. And um, that's and then you get to what's called the heat death, which is where basically all that's left in the universe is like this tiny little bit of waste heat from all of the processes of, of the cosmos. And at that point, kind of nothing else can happen anymore. Um, it's almost like and, a smoldering campfire. 
Yeah, but but even worse, it's like the, the whole campfire decays. <laughs> it's just, you know, you end up with a universe that has a tiny little bit of trace radiation that's just sort of waste heat from 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 the cosmos, and then uh, and then nothing. Would there um, be matter? Would the matter break down? Not is, really. Is... I mean, yeah, matter. So most. So we think that most particles can decay into other particles and into radiation. So most of the the matter that we know of would would you know decay into something else. Uh, there may be some particles that are long enough lived that they don't decay, but then they would be there would be like one in our cosmic volume, you know, like sort of wandering on its own. There would be very little uh, going on, um, and you so you just have this extremely diffuse, empty cosmos. That's and is that. it possible to to make estimates of of when that's going to happen? I mean, yeah. I mean, you how can long get does numbers, that take? But yeah. it's it's the kind of numbers that that just don't mean anything. You know, it's like ten to the sixty to the or ten to the ten to the sixty years or something. I mean, one of these things where you have to use many exponentials, and uh, you know, it, it's it's such a long time from now that it's it's kind of not a meaningful number anymore. Um, but you know, trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and so on years. So big crunch was a, a popular, uh, was a likely scenario that we've, with more information about the universe, we've discounted. The heat death seems like the most likely, but you address some other scenarios and, you know, but, but as, as we go into them, somebody's question was, um, Owen wants to know, can the universe explode? Mm. And uh, does that lead into any of the others that like, can well, you connect so that the- to another scenario? The next scenario that I was going to talk about, the big rip, is is sort of like a kind of explosion in the universe. So with with the heat death, that relies on the idea that dark energy is a cosmological constant, which means it's it's something that that it's just every little bit of space has some kind of expansion in it. And so as you have more space, you have more expansion, but like the the density of dark energy doesn't go up. So what that means is that if you have a volume of space in which there's a galaxy sitting there, that volume of space also has some dark energy in it, some cosmological constant, and the amount of dark energy in it is just going to stay the same. So it's it's got this little sort of you know stretchiness to it, but the the galaxy in there is doing just fine. It's held together by its own gravity. It's not going to be affected by the fact that the space that it's in has this little bit of stretchiness to it. It already kind of overcame that. Um, so in a cosmological constant universe, like one that goes to a heat death, um, if you have a galaxy, it's fine. It, it moves away from other galaxies. It might decay, but it's not going to be affected by the dark energy inside it. But if you have a different kind of dark energy called phantom dark energy, then that kind of dark energy is it, it's also something where there's a little bit of it in every bit of space, but it actually the density of it goes up. So if you have a volume of space where you have your nice galaxy living inside there, over time, there's more dark energy in that space than there was before. And that means it's able to start pulling apart that galaxy. So instead of just expanding by, you know, moving galaxies apart from each other, the expansion starts to move stars away from their galaxies. And then so it sort of dissipates galaxies and then it starts to pull planets away from their stars. And then it starts to pull at the matter that makes planets up. And so over time, you get this increasing amount of dark energy and it gets increasingly destructive. And so if we have this this phantom dark energy, which is this weird hypothetical kind of dark energy, then you can calculate that over time, more and more things get get ripped apart by, by this dark energy. You can also calculate that at some point in the future, and you can calculate what that date is if you know the properties of the dark energy. I think um, it's a Thursday. (laughs) <laughs> one would expect um, <laughs> if, if you you can calculate when the the expansion will get so extreme that it'll rip apart of space itself and that's called the big rip and that's kind of like an explosion because it it explodes everything and it destroys right. it destroys space as we know it the big rip and so so if you if it gets ripped apart What's in that space? Like you rip this apart. What's in right here? <laughs> we don't know. I mean, you know, what do you, we, all, all we know is that if we extrapolate the equations to that point, then what happens is that this, you know, the space in between any two arbitrarily close objects goes to infinity. That's what we're actually calculating. And that means that, you know, no matter how close together two points of space are, they're now infinitely far apart, which, what does that do? We, it's, that's kind pretty of hard far to, apart. Yeah. 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 It's kind of hard to to contemplate what that means. And and there are reasons to think that the big rip is unlikely because um 
because just theoretically, it's hard to sort of square that with some ideas we have about sort of fundamental principles of physics, um, energy conditions, things that when you're a theorist, you have to keep track of that we think are probably rules of the universe, but we haven't really proven. Um, so most people think that the big rip is not going to happen. And, but what we can do for sure is we can put a, we can put constraints on exactly how long it would be if it were going to happen. So we can, we can look at the expansion of the universe now and properties of, you know, how that expansion is changing over time. And we can say, well, given what we know about the universe, um, maybe the big rip is going to happen. Probably not. But if it were, we have at least 120, 120 billion years, something like that. Okay. 188 billion years, I think, is the current limit. Basically, because as we keep measuring dark energy, it looks more and more like a cosmological constant, but we can never be really sure. And if it's a little bit different from a cosmological constant, it could be this phantom stuff. And so mm -hmm. as we get a bit more and more precise measurements of dark energy, we can say with more and more certainty that the big rip is farther and farther into the future if it's ever going to happen at all. Okay, so then the big rip, like the big crunch and the heat death, um, even if that's the method, it's far distant future. All three yeah. of those scenarios are deep time far from yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. Um, what else have we got? <laughs> so that's a good we segue. Really only have a, maybe we have 15 minutes left, and okay. I do want to ask you a little bit about your public outreach. Okay. So these I'll, are- I'll go real quick. Are, are these less likely scenarios? Yeah, yeah. Well, so so the one, <laughs> so my favorite one is the one that could technically happen at any moment, and so it's called vacuum decay. And it's this idea that basically there's some there's some property of the universe that makes it just a little bit unstable, and this is something that we've learned through um, experiments like at the Large Hadron Collider, where we're measuring the standard model of particle physics very very carefully, and we're measuring the properties of of particles very very carefully. And what those measurements have shown us is that if the standard model of particle physics is true, then our universe is not entirely stable. And that means that there could be a quantum transition in something called the Higgs field, which is this sort of field of energy that pervades all of space. There could be this random uh, quantum transition somewhere in that Higgs field that could create a bubble of a different kind of space. It's called a true vacuum. And that bubble would be created at the point of that transition, and then it would sp expand outward at the speed of light, or about the speed of light, and just destroy everything in its path. And if that were to happen, that's called vacuum decay, sort of the decay of our vacuum of space through this true vacuum transition. And uh, because it's a quantum transition, it would be a probabilistic thing. It would be something we can't predict with certainty if it's gonna happen or not, but we can say, you know, probably in a certain length of time, maybe it'll happen, but maybe not. Um, and so it could technically happen at any moment, <laughs> uh, which is an and any prospect. And anywhere, right? It anywhere. could happen anywhere in the universe. So it could be, it could have already happened. It could have happened at Saturn and we'll only know in an hour and a half. Because, <laughs> or it could have happened near in, <laughs> yeah, yeah. near Andromeda yeah. and it's going to take two and a half million years for us to know. Right, right, exactly. Because if, if it's expanding at the speed of light, then you can't see it coming because by the time you see the light from it, it's already on top of you. <laughs> um, and if it's expanding that quickly, you also don't feel it when it hits you because your nerve impulses don't travel quite that fast. So it's a fairly like, you know, it's fairly humane. You don't see it yeah. coming. You don't feel it. You don't really notice. Um but it, it could happen at any moment, but based on our calculations, probably it's like at least 10 to the power of a hundred years off. Um, and also probably it can't happen at all because it relies on the standard, standard model of particle physics being the whole story. And as we've already discussed, we're pretty sure the standard model of particle physics is missing something that yeah. is not the whole story. And so there's probably something in there that tells us that actually these calculations aren't really valid, actually vacuum decay can't happen, but we don't know yet for sure. And so it's a fun thing to think about in the meantime. So that's four scenarios. What, what's the fifth one that you discuss in your book? The fifth one is these bouncing cosmologies. So I Oh, okay. So we even really the, talked about that already. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the, these ones that cycle between big bang and big crunch or, or right. in some cases, even you get a big bang and you get a heat death, but then that causes a yeah. new big bang. So there are a few different ways that you can get a cycle 
Um, and they're all speculative, you know, um, they're all kind of less accepted than, than the models that have a, an actual end, but yeah. they're, they're interesting because they allow you to explore things like extra dimensions or alternatives to this inflationary scenario yeah. or different reasons why there are certain appealing aspects to a cycling cosmology. And so they, that may be, that may turn out to be the thing that we are all studying in the future. We don't know yet. They're kind of, these are all sort of in development. That's super cool. And I like this. So the, like this, this, this framework of these five scenarios, how the universe may end is a great uh, structure to discuss all these astrophysical concepts. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a really fun thing. Is that yeah. I mean, and you to, obviously have all this fun to talk, and, yeah, <laughs> it's fun to talk about the end of the universe. And stars and physics and everything. <laughs> and I think at some point during, I think it was during the heat death that you mentioned that it like, it won't end well. And I was thinking, but it is a dine of natural causes. Yeah, <laughs> this yeah. is uh, Hey, so so this is your first book, but yeah. um, you've been writing for various magazines and websites and outlets for a long time, and you're yeah. very prolific on Twitter and mm -hmm. and at NC State where you're a professor. You um you're part of the leadership and public science cluster where mm -hmm. I I know that I, I believe that one of the reasons you even chose this job was because in addition to research public outreach was going to actually be part of your job. So tell me why yeah. that's important to you, that that why you uh, yeah. engage in so much public outreach. Well, I mean, part of it is, is probably obvious. I just really enjoy talking about these things. I, I, I find it a lot of fun to share physics and astronomy with people and, and to, to get excited about these, these topics. Um, and also, you know, I think it's important that people do this, that people share what we're learning because this is all, you know, this is all publicly funded science and, and, you know, we want to, um, we want to make sure that, that the work we do gets out to the public and, and that's something I enjoy doing. Um, but yeah, the reason, the reason this job is so, is so great for me is that most faculty jobs, um, expect that, you know, you become a professor and you have kind of three things that you do in your job. You do research, uh, and that's generally speaking, most of your, most of your um, sort of what you're evaluated on. So you do your research, uh, you do teaching. So you, you teach classes to undergraduates and graduate students, you supervise students as they're doing their own research. And then you do some kind of service, which is usually like serving on committees to hire new people or to, uh, you know, change the curriculum or whatever. So you do service and that's a little tiny fraction of your work, usually teaching and research are the big things. Um, but public engagement is, is usually not really, doesn't really fit in that picture very well. Sometimes it's in the service part. Sometimes it might be considered in the teaching part, but it's not something that's given the same kind of weight usually. And I wanted to, I wanted to have a job where I would be Get, I would get to do this public engagement. I would get to share my science and you know physics and astronomy in general with the world in a in a broad way and have that be part of my work. And so the leadership in public science is a uh, cluster is is really designed around that idea that all of us who are in the cluster, um, there are several faculty who do different aspects of science, but all of our science is something that is connected to the public, you know, either because the public is directly participating in it, like citizen science, or because we're um, we're talking to people as part of our research, or like me, um, I I do my research and then I talk about it. So I have, you know, I have that that kind of connection with the public, and that's and so it's great because it means that uh, you know I don't have to. I don't have to relegate the public engagement to like my free time, which as a professor, you don't have much of that. <laughs> um, but it can actually be part of my job and part of what I'm evaluated on when I'm, you know, going up for tenure and stuff like that. And I wonder, uh, you're most active on Twitter. Is there a reason why that platform has, uh, you gravitate um, towards it, so to speak? I, I don't know. I think it's, uh, it's, it's just, it's an easy way to talk about, um, talk about science. I also talk about a lot of other things. Uh, you know, lately I've been talking a lot about things revol revolving around the pandemic and stuff because that's what's going on. Um, so I, I can talk about other aspects of life as well as, as just physics. But I like Twitter because I can share little bits of information in an accessible way. I can link to more information. I can share, you know, images and stuff like that and, and really talk to people. Like you can be very interactive on Twitter. People can ask you questions, you can answer them. You can, you know, really it, it's much, a much more engaged way of communicating than just writing an article and having it be out there. Um, so I like that aspect that it really is very, 
uh, you know, very interactive. Um, and somehow, you know, it just seems to work really well for me. So um, it's it's done, you know, it's it's become this this really great platform for me. And and also the other thing I really like about it is that it gives me space to share a little bit more about who I am. And I think that's important that, you know, I think that it's important that scientists are not just sort of seen as these kind of science robots in this tower, uh, you know, doing this this cloistered thing and, and uh, having no other aspect to their life. I think it's important that people see that scientists are real people and that we have other interests and that we have our own sort of hopes and fears and, you know, we work hard and we have setbacks and, and all of that I think is important that I think people should see scientists as real people who don't all look like Einstein and sit in a, in an office all day. Like we actually, we actually, you know, have, have other <laughs> existences and other uh, interests. And, and I think that's important partially because it helps to it helps people understand how we work and like what we do, but also because it, it's easier for people to see themselves in scientists. If scientists are not depicted as these kind of like single-minded robot people. Yeah. And I think you do a great job of that. Your your voice is very natural, that, that your writing voice is very natural and comes across. And I just remembered and um, that uh, and I should have asked you that uh, when I was thinking of your other interests and I know a lot about you and in terms of music and what's the song by Hozier that uh, <laughs> it came out like a year or so ago. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, and it's even specific to this topic. What's the song? Yeah. Um, so there's a song called No Plan uh, by Hozier, and it's about the end of the universe. It's on his new album called Wasteland Baby. And it does it does specifically reference me. <laughs> it's in the chorus. It says, as Mac explains. As Mac, as Mac explained, there will be darkness again. There will be darkness yeah. again. It's exactly yeah. about this topic. And it's in the chorus. So he says it like three times in the song. He yeah. says your name. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's, yeah. it's wild. It's wild. And, 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 you know, even more than that, like he's, he's been, you know, he was on tour and he would go and, and um, you know, he would, he would introduce the song and talk about cosmology for a bit, which was really cool. That's and great then, outreach. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, it really was. And then he would also have uh, like quotes from me on the screen behind him uh, talking about the, the end of the universe and like say, you know, Dr. Katie Mack. <laughs> That's so like awesome. In these arena shows. And it's great because that, that's what you don't expect astrophysics outreach to penetrate a concert audience. Yeah. So that's really yeah, awesome. Yeah. No, it was, it was very cool. It was definitely a very And that's cool on him. Happened. That was all his doing. Yep. And, and he yep. approached you. You were following each other. I knew you you had met and had followed each other yeah. on, on, on Twitter. So that's super cool. And yeah. um, there is, you know, we're pretty much out of time. But there was another question in the in the chat, which... Do you think the universe is infinite or finite? Is there anything you can say to that at all? It's I, I mean, can't wrap my mind around either of those. Yeah, so it's so we don't have any evidence either way. We we don't have evidence of any kind of edge in to the universe in space. We know that there's a there's we know there's a, a an an edge to what we can see. So there's a boundary called the observable universe, the, the cosmic horizon, where we cannot see beyond that, and that's because of Basically, um, if you if you can define the cosmic horizon as some distance and stuff a little bit farther away from that is so far away that it would take light from that longer than the age of the universe to reach us. And so there has not been enough time. Like ever. So there, it's not a real <laughs> edge it's in not any an edge. way. It's no. just that beyond that, that stuff is never going to reach us. Yeah, yeah. So the light from that has not had time so far to reach us. And because the universe's expansion is speeding up, it will never reach us. So the light from that distance can't ever get to us. So we can't ever know anything about what's beyond there. So it may as well not be part of our universe, right? Yeah. It can't affect us. We can't see it. We'll never have any evidence of it. So that's called, that's the edge of the observable universe. And that's a real edge in our perception. But as far as we know, the universe just carries on. And we have reason to believe that the universe continues in much the same way beyond that you know, edge. Uh, but, but we don't have any way of knowing if it keeps going forever. We usually assume it does. We just assume, okay, infinite, because we have no evidence for a finite edge. And, you know, in the equation, it's just as easy to say, okay, it goes on forever. But yeah. we, we really don't know. Yeah. Well, this has been fantastic. I'm going to invite Constance to come back on with us okay. and um, 
Hello. Constance. Hey, Constance. Hello. So you see, I, I wanted you to know that at least one of the scenarios doesn't necessarily give us that much time. <laughs> I know this is crazy. My, I, I felt like my, my brain was expanding beyond, you know, its capabilities and it could as, as Owen asked, you know, maybe it could explode. I don't know. This is fantastic <laughs> stuff, Katie. Thank you so much for, uh, for, for talking with us. And I'm, I'm so excited about your public outreach because, of course, that's what Neutrino Day is all about. It's all about helping people mm -hmm. um, understand what's going on in science and, and understand the value of it. So we really, really appreciate that. I wanted to also ask you if you are familiar with Ariel Waldman. Yeah, yeah. She she's was great. a she was a guest of ours a couple years ago, and she talked about this whole citizen science um, mm -hmm. uh, 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 idea that you brought up, and um, we had yeah. a whole discussion about that, and it was fantastic. And I love the idea of citizens just getting out there and doing science. So yeah, yeah, it's great. There's so many so many good projects. You should you know check out uh, the Zooniverse. Uh, so yeah. zoo universe. Okay. Um, is is a that lot what really Galaxy Zoo became Galaxy part zoo. of? Now it's the zoo universe. Yeah. And also, yeah. I'd like to know, because I'm very friendly with these people, SciStarter.org yeah. is an aggregator, uh, and you can find tons of different citizen science projects there. Yeah, tons. so those those two uh, have a zoo ton of, of things that you can get involved in. They're really great. Well, Katie, one of these days, um, I'm going to have you come to surf. Uh, we'd love to have <laughs> you as a as a guest here. Um, I talked with, you know, Brian was supposed to be here this week. And of course, uh, with the pandemic, we've all gone virtual yeah. and, um, yeah. and well, so I'd love to come by. we'd love to have maybe the two of you come and, and, uh, take you on a tour of our underground facilities, which That'd reminds me, we've That's got, awesome. I was supposed to be underground today. I yes, think you were, you were supposed to, and you were supposed to be doing a live interview with South Dakota public broadcasting today. That's usually right. what we do. So. A lot of things had to change this year, and um, we're, we're just thrilled that you were able to make this a part of your week, Katie. So, so thank you so much. Now, great. I'm going to go through a few things that are coming up. Okay. At noon today, we are going to be uh, talking about the math behind the hoists. Um, you know, we have these hoists from 1939 that are still uh, used to <laughs> convey people up and down a mile long shaft. So we're going to learn about those those hoists and, and what the, what kind of math goes into making sure all of this works the right way because it's pretty fascinating. I know 1939 sounds crazy old, but <laughs> these things are so well maintained and they're really just, uh, it's a thing of beauty to, to watch them operate. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. We also have several um, anytime activities at NeutrinoDay.com. I don't know if you've had a chance to go and play on our website, Katie, but I hope you will. And then you could even just for fun fill out our do the investigator notebook and and uh, and see see what that's all about. Now today we also have at two o'clock our bad science jokes face off with Brian and uh, Mark Hanhart, our experiment support scientist here at Surf. Um, I'm I'm really excited about that. I want to see what people have come up with, and and there's actually going to be a prize attached to that. Um, I you do, solicited bad science jokes from from the audience, and and we we did that on purpose. I'm just going to yeah. say we we did it on purpose. Um, uh, so so it's uh, you know we're going to get what we asked for, I think, but it, but it should still <laughs> be fun. Now. Tomorrow is the last day of Neutrino Day, and that sounds, seems weird to say that, but it'll be six days of Neutrino Day after tomorrow. And um, we've got a lot of other things still going on. Tomorrow, uh, we are going to have at 10 o'clock, or yeah, 10 o'clock in the morning, there is going to be a virtual tour of the Davis campus, which is where uh, the Lux Zeppelin experiment is, as well as the Majorana demonstrator which is looking for neutrinoless double beta decay. And um, so we'll, you'll be able to see what that, that space looks like. And we will also have one more um, education and outreach activity with Deb Wolf at noon, and they are going to be investigating the unseen. So she's got some pretty cool demonstrations for us. I'm, I'm excited about that. 
And then, of course, at 2 o'clock tomorrow, we have Brian for the last time this week coming back to, ta- to do a little, um, uh, a little uh, fun uh, stand-up comedy special, Just Add Gravity. I'm really excited about that, Brian. We're going to try to have some people up here to, <laughs> yes. to, to watch. And, and, of course, we're all going to social distance and have our masks on. Um, and I hope everybody out there will join us. Uh, because it's, it's just going to be, I expect it's going to be great fun. Now, before I leave, I want to thank a few people. First of all, I want to thank our speakers who have joined us this week, Katie, uh, Simon Fiorucci, Ryan Patterson, Mark Hanhart, and of course, Brian, you've just been awesome. We've loved having you every day this week. You know, that's just been part of what's made this so great. I want to also thank our partners who uh, contributed Anytime Activities, to our event. I want to thank our education and outreach team who pro- provided live activities every day this week. And um, I also need to thank our major corporate sponsors. We're very fortunate to have a group of, of uh, organizations and folks who help us every year. They're committed to making Neutrino Day work. And uh, Black Hills Energy has been a sponsor of this event for 12 years. So since the very first Neutrino Day, Black Hills Energy has been a part of it, and we are so grateful to them. New this year is RCS Construction, um, and and we're so grateful for their support. Also, uh, we have Monument Health, South Dakota School of Mines and Technology, Black Hill State University, and South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Great partners to have every year for Neutrino Day. We also have in-kind sponsors, Howgo Broadcasting, Home Slice Media Group, KEVN Black Hills Fox, Kelloland, Simpsons Printing, Mile Up Marketing, and the Allied Arts Council. All of them have helped make this just a fantastic event. Finally, I want to say a few thank yous to the team here. We've had tremendous support from our management team. We have had tremendous support from our IT team, and I neglected to mention them earlier this week, but they helped make sure that we had a stable internet connection and strong network connections, all the things that IT people do to make things work. So thank you to Deb Myers and her team. Um, Also, I have to thank my Neutrino Day Planning Committee and my own uh, communications team. This has been a huge effort, and we're all in a whole different atmosphere, a whole different environment. We have never done anything like this before. We've had some glitches along the way. We've readjusted and moved forward, and I can't say enough about my team. And if you want to read a little bit more about who the team is, please go to NeutrinoDay.com and and learn a little bit more about our planning committee. Brian and Katie, I want to thank you again for joining us today. What an incredible discussion. Um, What an awesome, awesome uh, discussion that that you had today. I really appreciate it. Any last thoughts, Katie, before you take off? Um, uh, Yeah, if you're you're interested in learning more about the end of the universe, my book is available for pre-order. So um, so check it out. Where do we find it? It's good. It's uh, so... You can find it on my website, uh, astrokatie.com, or you can just look it up. Uh, the title is The End of Everything, Astrophysically Speaking. And um, there are a bunch of pre-order links on my website. And we're even doing like a pre-order promotion. So check Excellent. that out. Excellent. Available where all books are sold. All right. So um, we'll definitely um, be pushing that out a little bit. Thank you again. I look forward Thank to you. seeing all of you tomorrow. Thanks for joining us for Neutrino Day. Thanks. Thanks.